Hey everybody and welcome to the last video in the Social Psych Summer Lecture Series. This is the final topic that we are discussing today and it is on a lighter subject, a pro-social behavior. How are we actively being good in our daily lives? How are we being good for the society that we live in? So we're going to define what it means to help, which is specifically the pro-social behavior that we're focusing on in this lecture. Uh, and then we're going to describe the types of helping, why we help, when do we help, who helps, who is helped. And when we talk about who is helped, we'll talk a, a little bit about the fascinating story of Kitty Genovese in uh, relation to... Uh, the bystander effect, and uh, how social psychology research heard about this story and wanted to do learn more about it and do more about it. So let's define our terms. So we have altruism. Altruism, you've probably heard of, is unselfish behavior that benefits others without the re regard to consequences to the self. Okay, so it's helping to help. True altruism is difficult to actually achieve. You can engage in altruistic behavior, but is it real altruism? Well, probably not. Because lots of people do altruism for the sake of feeling good. And because you are feeling good and you feel good about that, it, um, it's no longer altruism. No longer altruistic. As you feel good and you recognize that you feel good. Um, it's very difficult to obtain true altruism. Now, the newer definition, the broader definition, is now prosociality or prosocial behavior, which is any act of helping, regardless of motive. So we're going to call it helping behavior, shall we? So we have acts of kindness, acts of bravery, and volunteerism. Okay? These are three kinds of helping. Acts of kindness are common. They're short-lived and very low or moderate costs associated with this. Things like paying it forward, uh, opening the door for someone, um, saying hello, giving a smile in the United States. Acts of bravery or heroism are generally speaking uncommon. By definition, bravery or heroism should be uncommon. They are generally short-lived but the cost is quite high, especially in the case of people who may, may, may pay the ultimate price and sacrifice. Volunteerism is the third kind. These are common. Commitment is, generally speaking, sustained. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the cost depends, so we'll call it moderate. So those are the, th those are the three types of helping that you'll see. Acts of kindness, volunteerism, acts of bravery or heroism. So why do people help? Well, lots of times people will help for self-focused reasons. So the social rewards that we get for helping, praise, attention, honors, gratitude, or, so those are the things that we seek, but we can also avoid in social reward, well, social shunning, uh, and social punishment. We also might help because of personal distress. We may be motivated to help to reduce our own distress. It makes feel better. Uh, and this is so this is may seem more altruistic, but it is still a self focused reason for helping. Others focus helping include things like empathic concern, identifying with another person feeling and understanding what that person is experiencing, which generally comes with the, the intention or desire to help. Oops, sorry about hitting the mic there. <clears throat> so where do people help? Where do people help? Well, the location is very important. Okay, so here we have the percentage of participants who respond to helping in urban or rural situations, so correcting overpayments, most people will generally help, but 
uh, over half of rural respondents will correct an overpayment. Helping an injured pedestrian, very few urbanites um, help an injured pedestrian. Helping a lost child, again, the vast majority of people will say that they help lost children, and then giving donations, again, occurs more rurally than um, in urban settings. Okay, And urban features generally play a role in helping behavior. Okay, So less helping overall, as you can see, because a higher population density, higher cost of living, as well as some of the other factors that I'll cover next. Other social uh, situational determinants um, have to do with time pressure. So I have a, the Good Samaritan study to help explain this. So this is from John Darley and Batson in 1973. Okay. So participants were seminary students who were assigned to give a speech across campus. And um, if you're not familiar with the Good Samaritan, according to the Gospel of Luke, so this is Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase for you. A traveler who may or may not have been Jewish is beaten, robbed, and left half dead along the road. First a priest and then a Levite come by, but both avoid the man. Finally, a Samaritan which is which was the name of a group of people at the time, comes by. Samaritans and Jews generally despised each other, but the Samaritan helps the injured man nevertheless. Jesus is described as telling the parable in response to a question regarding the identity of the neighbor, where in Leviticus, God says... The neighbor should be loved. Love thy neighbor, right? So Le Leviticus 19.18 says, love thy neighbor. And somebody was like, well, who's the neighbor? And Jesus was like, yo, it's the guy you hate the most. All right. So seminary students were like, okay, they should know about the Good Samaritan parable from Jesus, right? Seminary students. So um, that's the New Testament tale, right? So the time pressure was the manipulated variable for all of these seminary students. Some were, um, so there are three groups. Some were um, given a time to arrive that was ahead of the speech. Some were given a time that was right at the moment their speech should be. And then the third group was given a time to arrive that was after the speech should begin, which kind of sucks, right? Um, so they're running late. And so the, the, de the dependent variable in this case was a confederate slumped in a doorway, doorway moaning and coughing. Okay? Every single person did that. So who helped? Knowing that they know about the Good Samaritan, knowing that they know about the Good Samaritan, and you can clearly see here that the people who were early were the ones who stopped because there was no time pressure. On time, less than half. Late, less than 10%, or about 10%. Stopped and helped. So time pressure. It's a thing. Are we going to help when we're running low on time? The answer is no. So we have location, time pressure. How about mood? Mood is interesting. When we are in a positive mood, we feel good and we want to keep feeling good, so we end up helping. Isn't that interesting? When we're in a negative mood, we actually might feel guilty and be in personal distress, which is one of the ways that I said um, instigate somebody to help. And there's actually a model that um, identifies this. It's called a negative state relief model. This model states that human beings have an innate drive to reduce negative moods. They can be reduced by engaging in mood-elevating behavior, which includes helping behavior, as it is paired with positive value like smiles and thank yous. Thus, negative mood increases helpfulness because helping others can reduce one's own bad feeling. 
as we get older, we learn that helping is typically re positively reinforced. So when we see the sad Sarah McLaughlin ads in the arms of the angel, I away from here. You know, when we see those ads or news coverage of tsunamis, hurricanes, we want to help, which in turn makes us feel better. Now, is that altruism? I argue it's not. Another situational determinant is who is around, who is around and who can um, help us. So, or who is around, who can help, who can't help, that's, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so the idea here is that how many people determines how much help. So I'm going to put a pin in that when we get to Kitty Genovese and the um, and the bystander effect. So that's a situational determinant that I will put a pin in. And so in the interim, let's talk about what gets in the way of helping. Okay, so here's a flow chart uh, based on Baron and Byrne. So a man was found in his car, the body of a man, was found in his car next to a busy road in New Zealand after lying undiscovered for five days. This was in 2013. Alvin Singh was 34, and he was found next to an intersection in Papatoto, Auckland, after a resident raised the alarm. He was last seen leaving his home in Mangir on February 22nd. His body was not found until several days later. Detective Inspector Guthrie, or Guthrie said it was unusual for a body to lay undiscovered for such a long period of time, but it was not easy to spot Mr. Singh in the car because his body was in a lying position. He said Mr. Singh had been, been in the front of the car, which was reclined, and was rolled over on the seat. Okay. So that's an interesting tale. An interesting story about what gets in the way of helping. Well, the first one, you have to notice. So these are the five ways to help. You have to notice the problem. Okay? What gets in the way of that? Distraction. Then you have to interpret the, uh, the uh, situation. And what gets in the way of that? Something called pluralistic ignorance. If nobody else seems worried then you're not going to do anything about it because if nobody else is worried, then why should you be worried? Okay. Number three, assume responsibility to help. What gets in the way of, uh, of assu uh, assuming responsibility? What's called the diffusion of responsibility. Someone else might be taking care of it, so I don't need to take care of it. So that's my diffusion of responsibility. Okay. Number four, you have to know how to help. You have to know how to help. What gets in the way of knowing how to help? Well, your lack of confidence in, in whatever abilities you have. Calling 911. I don't know if I can call 911 properly. <sighs> do I know how to do CPR? I don't know how to do CPR. I was certified yesterday, but I don't know it. And number five, you have to decide to help. Okay. What gets in the way of deciding to help? Well, the audience inhibition. Uh, you can look dumb. You can be like, what? is there a doctor on board? W well, yeah, I I'm a doctor. Not that kind of doctor. Okay. Other things about deciding to help that fall into audience inhibition are things like danger to yourself. Do I want to jump? Do I want to leap over this chasm? Legal concerns. Remember when Superman was um, sued in Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, for helping a guy? Yeah, that seems kind of stupid. But legal concerns. Embarrassment. What if you also get stuck and then need help because you were trying to save someone and you guys like, oh, I'm now stuck in the mud. Oh, God. Gil's always getting stuck in the mud. 
right? So how we break some of these, how we break some of these barriers to this five step helping guide is to notice something. Need help? Get somebody's attention, right? Interpretation. Make it clear you need help. Responsibility. Pick a specific person. So if you're in the park and there are a bunch of people walking by and be like, you, sir, you, you, come help me now. You, sir, I demand you come and help me. And then knowledge. Always ask. Always ask. You can always ask. It's always fine to ask. What about people makes them more likely to help? Well, trait empathy. If you have a trait in your personality that is more empathetic than others, you are more likely to help people. Yep, yeah, just some people are more empathetic and this is a trait that they have, so they're more likely to help people than people who have, don't have trait empathy or a lower amount of trait empathy. Uh, socioeconomic status. Lower social classes tend to help more. They tend to be more collectivistic because resources are extremely limited. What the resources they do have tend to be shared. Gender. Men do more heroic and brave acts. They'll tend to be more blatant with their charitable dona donations. Okay? Especially for strangers. Women do more small acts. Very nurturing acts. Especially for close people. More favors more caregiving. Religiosity, people who are religious tend, tend to be more helpful, but that really depends, okay? Uh, in the short term, though, regardless if you're religious or not, time pressure or situational features are very influential because as we saw with those seminary students, very religious, um, but those guys who were late, those, those men and women who were late to the speech did not help because of the time pressure. So, yeah, it, um, yeah, it's a, it, 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 it's a, it's a bummer. It's a real, real bummer. Mm -hmm. Gotta bummer it up. All right. So who is helped in these situations? Who? is helped. Well, if they are similar to you, they're going to be helped. You're going to help them quite a bit. If they're attractive, yep, what is beautiful is good stereotype from uh, a few videos ago. If they're very attractive, then you're going to help them. And victim responsibility. We will help way more if we don't think that the reason they're in this situation is because it's their fault. And this falls back to the belief in a just world. If people bring it on themselves, they don't need help. They won't get my help, etc. Okay. So how much responsibility does the victim have in this situation? So here we're going to talk about Kitty Genovese. This is the end bit of the video, but there don't worry, there's still more. Okay. We're going to talk about Kitty Genovese and how she instigated research in what is now referred to as the bystander effect. I keep hitting pop filter. So Kitty Genovese was murdered and sexually assaulted early in the morning of March 13th, 1964 in Kew Gardens in Queens, New York. Okay. There were three separate attacks. The first attack was moving around the court courtyard and then um, as she was being stabbed, she um, was moving around her building and he kept leaving and, and returning because uh, the attacker kept leaving and returning because <clears throat> her screams were so loud. And according to the news report that came out um, following the attack, 38 ne neighbors heard at least one of the three attacks. Nobody came to her aid. No, only one person called the police, but it was until the third attack had had silenced her. OK, so it got sensationalized press coverage, horrified the nation, and it prompted research. So let's take a listen 
to a little bit of a documentary on this. In 1964, 38 New Yorkers watched through their windows as one of their neighbors was brutally murdered. Her name was Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old woman. The Genovese incident where a young woman coming home late at night from her work was assaulted by somebody who was one of those random crazy people. Kitty was running up the block and Winston Mosley ran after her until she reached the midpoint of the block almost directly under this street light. Mosley caught up with her and stabbed her four times in the back. Her screams were loud, unmistakable, and reverberated throughout the entire area. Lights went on in, in the windows around the courtyard, so we know that people were seeing this. Nobody called the police. Somebody who lived on the seventh floor opened his window and yelled out, what's going on down there? When Mosley heard somebody yelling out, he ran back to his car. Kitty was still alive. She managed to get up. She staggers around the corner here, still screaming. People in that building heard her as well. And she collapses inside this hallway. There's one apartment above there. It was occupied by Carl Ross. Carl opened his door at the time that Mosley returns and he saw the second attack taking place. And he did nothing. After stabbing Kitty another eight times in this very hallway, the killer ran away, leaving Kitty to bleed to death. Eventually, a neighbor called the police, but it was too late. Kitty died before the ambulance could get her to the hospital. That shot the city. Now, it's not that a person got murdered to shock the city. That happens, sadly. It's that a person got murdered and her neighbors watched and nobody did anything. So what you can kind of gather from that <clears throat> is something like this. Somebody lying on the floor and everyone having their own thoughts about what happened to this person. He really doesn't need help. He'll be okay. I'm sure someone else will handle it. I guess he's drunk. So we've got um, misattributions. We have diffusion of responsibility. And then what's represented by these four bystanders is pluralistic ignorance. Okay. And so the idea behind the bystander effect is that the more people there are to witness an event, the less likely any one of them are to help. OK, and Darley and Bib uh, Joe John Darley, who you saw in that video and Bib Latne um, also did several um, studies of research that um, explored this. So let me play a little bit for you here in this so this is um a condition in a room where the participant is alone and what they did was they had a smoke generator in a adjoining room produce smoke and they wanted to they were timing how long it took someone to get up and go seek help so so with all of these cameras present they were um they were just had a stopwatch just how long does it take for group size to impact somebody seeking help? And so you can see that there are plenty of other chairs in there. And this is a condition where there is one participant, that woman there, and a bunch of other Confederates. Okay? And so now the so smoke starts coming and you get pluralistic ignorance here. 
and there you can they put the timer on the the thing see how long it takes for this participant to do anything about what they are seeing like oh okay none of these people are worried about it so maybe i'm not worried about it it's 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 it's, it's quite thrilling and they replicated this over and over and over again. And you can see this woman is sitting here for six minutes since the smoke started appearing. And that's all she is consumed with. Nobody else is consumed with anything in this because they're all Confederates. Ten minutes goes by and she is not doing anything because of pluralistic ignorance. Uh, 20 minutes, they stop, and then so they just, like, pause the whole thing. It's just like, wow. Wow. So that is um, Darley and Latine, some of their work. They did um, several others. Um, that, so they, they replicated the fire in the room quite a bit. Um, they've done also where people wore headphones and were talking to each other over an intercom system. And they had a recording of somebody having a um, a seizure or a, a breathing problem. And it depended on how many people were on the headsets, uh, determined how many people would um, go and help this one person. Okay, So Kitty Genovese has basically become a modern parable okay kind of kind of like the good samaritan kind of like a good samaritan right so the classic story is that 38 witnesses nobody didn't did anything that's 100 percent a myth um there was a uh an exploration of the events from the 1960s uh five years ago i believe um the new york times got the story and a lot of the facts, very wrong, very wrong. Um, but unfortunately, because it was put that way into textbooks, textbooks tend to have the inertial momentum running through that people tend to have inertia um, with textbook facts. So what was wrong about it? Well, there weren't 38 witnesses. There were probably about a dozen. and. Those dozen knew what was going on. And two people knew that she'd been stabbed. And one person who called the police. Yeah, so we know about the one person who called the police after it. But there was actually another person who called the police before she died. But nobody saw the entire attack. Most of the building layouts were obscuring many of the attacks. Or the, the three attacks. Especially the last one by Mosley that occurred within the um, vestibule uh, stairs, okay? And the idea that windows were open and um, people had, you know, uh, been listening, and it's 3 a.m. on a cold March night. Most people had their windows, windows closed. But it, it did have the effect of instigating this research, and this research has been fruitful because the mechanism of the bystander effect is very robust. It's a very powerful effect. The more people you have that do nothing in a group, the less likely there will be any help for any victim. And is it really real? Well, you can go look up just anything having to do with what would you do? The ABC News um, special uh special companion piece to like dateline what would you do um the effect is real so even though kitty genovese's story is not correct or as far as it's described in psychology textbooks it is still an example of the bystander effect because it's very real people didn't go and try to stop mosley from harming her okay um, and so I include a link here to um, a young Chinese girl who was run over by a van about 10 years ago and 19 people passed her by. Um, if you're upset easily by these things, I recommend not watching it um, or just knowing that it is a um, 
and it's, it's an upsetting piece. Okay, so, all right, that's the end of this video lecture series. Uh, please leave your comments and suggestions and feedback down below. Generate those questions. There are no more videos after this one. You've reached the end. Oh, so I won't say until the next episode. Thanks for watching these. Bye.